Hi, everyone, and welcome to Tell Me About Podcast, where each week, two nerdy friends deep dive random topics. I'm Laura. And I'm Tom. And this is episode number 17. So before we get started this week, we have a little podcast business to announce. We've been teasing this for a couple of weeks. This is actually going to be our last full show of 2023. So we will be back with full episodes in 2024, in uh, early January of 2024. The key word there is full episodes, because we're announcing today that during the two-week break that we're going to be off, uh, we're going to be off December 27th and January 3rd, we're going to be trying some mini-episodes. They're like mini-sodes. They're fun-size episodes. Kind of just a little... A little taste, a little tasting, a little hors d'oeuvre of an episode. If if the, if the, if a podcast is a meal, this is like the cocktail weenie. This is the pigs in the blanket. This is just a, a a little a little palate cleanser, a little appetite wetter, a little stocking stuffer, if you will. Yes, we don't know how many of these we're going to do. We're going to try to record as many as we can over the two weeks, as depending on what our schedule allows. A couple of them will be holiday themed with some other things thrown in there. Unlike a a regular episode, which will come out on usually on Wednesdays, unless certain software that shall not be named decides to literally eat the podcast. These are going to come out basically whenever we can get them up. So this is something new that we're trying. And really, we want to get y'all's feedback on what you think about it whether you like the the shorter kind of episodes whether you like the more full episodes we we really want to get your feedback because if this is something that you guys respond to and you like we want to do things that cater to you guys if this is something that you like we'll do more of these if you like the fuller episodes we'll do more of those and we'll kind of save these little morsels for uh when we know we're not going to be able to record full episodes so this is something that we're going to try we want your feedback whether you like it or dislike it and we hope you enjoy it it's just a little something to get you through the holidays before our next full episode which will be on january 10th so definitely stay tuned for that and let us know what you think about them And with that, Lori, are you ready to talk about some financial crimes? Sure. Sounds good. So what we're talking about today is something that, believe it or not, is 22 years old. No. Is it 22 years? 22 years old. It's something that grabbed a lot of headlines at the time. And considering that this was in... October, November of 2001, that's saying something. Where were you in 2001? What is What did 2001 Tom look like? 2001 Tom was in eighth grade, had maybe a little peach fuzz, and the voice was still very cracking. He was on the swim team, but yet he still couldn't dive. Normally, we would do a full deep dive into this financial scandal, that's really not going to serve anyone here, though, because quite frankly, there are a couple of documentaries and books that you can read that really explain this a lot better than I ever could. So you mean the technical aspects of it? That's exactly what I mean, the technical aspects of it. What I am going to do is give you a overview as best I can about what happened and also give you a bit of personal perspective because I got to witness some of this. Not in a bad way, in a in a bystander way. I was not named in any federal indictments. Well, that's good. I was 15 years old. I wasn't working. You could have been the youngest person to commit financial crimes. <laughs> Say financial crimes one more time in case nobody's listening. But this is something that I got to experience secondhand because it was happening where I was living at the time. So today, before there was WorldCom, 
before there was Tycho, before there was Lehman Brothers and Bernie Madoff, there was Enron. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, the story of Enron, you all know how Enron ended. It ended with a company that was pretty much the it company in the new in the year 2000 and less than 10 months later was bankrupt a lot of people don't know the story behind it so what i'm going to get into a little bit is the story behind it and why things happened the way that they did you also probably know the two main players behind enron the uh, chairman ken ken lay and the CEO and President Jeffrey Skilling. And that's a tease for later on because you'll see when I get there. But basically, they were considered the heads, really the figureheads of this extremely powerful company and extremely well liked company. Part of the reason why Enron got away with what it got away with for as long as it did was due to a very, very expansive and successful PR campaign that basically had almost the entire financial media and the entire financial community just snowed, just completely buying into the myth. No one really knew what it was Enron did. I have to tell you, I I still don't know what Enron really did. And I don't think a lot of people actually do know what Enron did. If you've ever seen, and I can't recommend it enough, uh, the documentary, The Smartest Guys in the Room, which is based off a book uh, by the two fortune writers who really kind of started the, I wouldn't say pop the Enron bubble, but started the slow deflation of it in 2001. Enron is kind of described as a middleman, and it's founded in the 80s by Kenneth Lay merging a couple of companies to become kind of a, I guess you would call it, they're not really an energy company because they're not like a, like a Con Edison or a Pico or Brooklyn Union or like the, the power's not coming from their plants, so to so speak. My question is, is there a product that they're selling? It's explained as started as buying and selling natural gas. Mm-hmm. And being a marketplace kind of middleman for buying and selling natural gas to, as they describe it, end users. From what I can ascertain, they were, I guess, kind of like the middleman. Like they were the ones facilit- facilitating the sale between the pipeline and the energy company. And you're going to see a big part of the problem with Enron is no one really knew how they made their money. I always remember that being a big part of the story, like not knowing exactly how they made their money and how they made their money so quickly and how much of it. I know generally the idea of the story, not a lot of the details. So I'm interested to hear about this. So Ken Lay is really, he's, he's the ground floor and he's building the company up through the first few years. As he's working with Enron, the first couple of years, he's really, he is the loudest voice for, at the time, deregulation. Energy prices were very heavily capped at the time in the 80s. And he got in the ears of some very powerful people to really lead the push to deregulate the energy markets. He was very much one of those, quote unquote, believers in the free market. This was a really big point of emphasis, for example, during the Reagan presidency was getting government out of economics and really letting the quote unquote free market determine prices. You're hundred percent right on that. The certainly the Reagan areas were very pro company, pro corporation. So I can see where this was really born out of that and, and probably thrived pretty well in the eighties. It absolutely did. It also helps that Ken Lay becomes very, very friendly with a famous family from Connecticut who moves to Texas. The Bushes? So Ken Lay becomes very close to George Sr. 
it's during this time the Bushes are down there. Uh, George Bush W is one of the owners of the Texas Rangers during the 90s, the baseball team, which he then leaves to become governor of Texas. And Ken Lay is very, very close to them during this period. So all along when he started this company, he was already in the pocket of politicians. Or the po- the politicians were in the pocket of him. And we'll see that later on. It becomes pretty well known that Enron is the largest corporate contributor for the first presidential campaign of George W. Bush. It's around this time in the early to mid-90s that Ken Lay then really has Enron take off. He hires Jeffrey Skilling to be his CEO. Can I ask, how did they know each other? Do you know? I don't know how they know each other. Jeffrey Skilling kind of is a maverick. He's Harvard Business School trained, but he's brought on to be the CEO. And they kind of are very similar in that they believe in this survival of the fittest. And it becomes kind of the corporate culture of of Enron. Is this, I know we talked a lot about Darwinianism last week with Action Park. It really was the Enron culprit culture. It was basically greed is good. And if you have to stomp on somebody's throat to get an extra few bucks, then you, you know, you crush their throat. Well, that's one way to do it. That is one way to do it. It's definitely not for everybody. But it's during this time that Jeffrey Skilling sets into motion something that would lead to the downfall. And that is that. Enron be allowed to use something called mark-to-market accounting. There's a very technical definition of mark-to-market accounting that would make your head spin unless you're a a tax attorney. Basically, the the best way to describe it and the way it's described in, in the book and the documentary, the way I understand it is it's a way for Enron to book future profits on a deal on the day it's made regardless of how much money actually comes in, actually is made. Is that legal? Funny you should say that. Congress allowed them to do it. And Arthur Anderson, and you're going to hear their that name, the accounting firm and Enron's lawyers signed off on it, said it was okay. Wait, so you're saying that their lawyer signed off and said it was fine. So it's not like they consulted a non-biased party for this. Their lawyer said it was fine. Their lawyer said it was fine. Their accounting firm, which was a very well-known accounting firm, Arthur Anderson, said it was fine. And Congress allowed them to do it. When you can book future profits of a deal based on the present value of money at the time the deal is made, you can basically say your profits are whatever you say they are. I already don't like this. You and me both. You could say, hey, listen, in 10 years, we're going to sell. I'm going to use the term widgets here because every law school hypothetical involving sales involves these hypothetical non-real products called widgets. Not very imaginative. No, no. But this is how basically every hypothetical involving a sale is, is described in law school. But you can say, we're going to sell these widgets for X amount of dollars. Instead of having their book show what the actual money coming in was and what the cost coming going out was, well, they can just say, hey, in 10 years, we're going to make $25 million off of this and just add it to the books. I still don't get how that's legal. You're you're legitimately just making shit up. The, one of the lines in in the documentary Uh, that Peter Coyote, who's the narrator, says is the profits to the outside world, the profits could be whatever Enron says they are. That's just insane. Right after that, they cut to one of Enron's old oil traders who basically said, he doesn't understand how you could say we're going to sell such and such, I think, gas out of this plant for $10 million when there hasn't even been a cent coming in yet. And the other thing, too, is... When that happens, when you can just make the profits whatever you want them to be, well, then it's real easy to constantly make projections every quarter because you can just say, we made our we made our earnings projections. I guess I still don't get it because you need 
you need some sort of cash supply. You need something either from the bank or in liquid cash. You know what I mean? I don't understand that. So there was money coming in. It just was never the amount that Enron was saying it was. Okay. So what you're saying is it wasn't making it up. It was just falsifying what was the actual number. Exactly. Because the books were, were based on money that was projected to come in instead of money that was actually coming in. Okay. So they weren't just making up fake accounts and fake deals well, like they were deals, but uh-oh. Well, we'll get to that. As Enron is using this mark-to-market accounting, they're constantly meeting their profit projections. Well, of course they are. So what happens? The stock price goes up because they're constantly meeting or beating whatever the analysts or stock people, you know, Jim Cramer yelling in a in a booth somewhere with with sound effects and 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 bullhorns. So as they're meeting, they're constantly meeting their earnings projections. Their stock price is going up. They're becoming more and more stock darlings in the financial media because basically they're meeting their projections like clockwork. This is where kind of the greed comes in. Because what happens when you start getting bigger and bigger profits, that becomes the norm. So now, as we get into, and and I'm jumping around here, there's a lot that that I I haven't mentioned. But as we get into the mid to late 90s, and the stock is really starting to, to get rolling, there becomes a lot of pressure to keep the stock price up. Enron is paying people with stock. So there's a lot invested in making sure that the stock price never falls because this is basically what's keeping the company afloat. Do you think they were the first or one of the first companies to do this or no? Had had that been done fairly often prior to this? I mean, if we're talking about like the, and I think we mentioned it a couple episodes ago, like a pump and dump scandal. Oh, yeah, with Gene Mulvihill and, and yeah. before he purchased Action Park, yeah. They were definitely not the first. They might have been the highest profile. It, this was being done everywhere in the 90s. This is just how the game was played because this is how high finance does it. It's, you know, it's the executives pumping the stock price up and then cashing in on the options. It's a classic story, isn't it? Tale as old as time, song as old as rhyme, pump and dump. There's also a very, very macho, manly man, man culture in Enron. Uh, The documentary talks about how there was a process called the peer review council, where basically all the employees were ranked on a scale of one to five, and 10% of the employees had to be a five, and then they, those 10% 10% were let go every year. So basically 10% of people were laid off every year just because other people thought they were they were horrible at the company. It was known to be rank and yank. Again, at this point, Enron is getting a ton of positive press from the financial media. They're the finan- they're the darlings of the financial world. They consistently keep making profits. They consistently keep showing a profit. They consistently beat their projections. The stock price goes up. At this point, no one still really knows what it is they do. There's a a very aggressive commercial campaign. That's the commercials that the slogan was asked why. I'll send you that in the chat. They are performance art. It's basically just a finance bros fever dream. What volume from 135? It's like I'm blind. I can't see what's going on. I don't know what the market price is. The way they used to deal with it, if you needed something and you needed it now, it could take you hours, days. When did the price change? What is the real price? What is the real price? The, price? the price was hidden. And it took an incredible amount of work to dig it out. Enron Online will change the markets for many, many commodities. 
It is creating an open, transparent marketplace that replaces the dark, blind system that existed. It is real simple. You turn on your computer, and it's right there. And if you want to do business, you push the button. So that's our vision. Uh, we're trying to change the world. So I have a couple of thoughts. First, why? <laughs> Second of all, you have no fucking idea what this is about. I'm, I, I'm sure it's, it seems like it's about investing or money or something with the stock market. That's the vibe I get. But still not clear on, on what they're selling or what they do completely. I would just assume investing. And then three, why were there three blind mice? Yeah, that, well, that's the fable, the three blind mice. But what does it have to do with the commercial? I'm just presenting the information. <laughs> only, a fi only a true finance bro gets, sees the symbolism in that. It's probably something about paradigms and the shattering of paradigms. For those of you, this obviously is not a visual medium, as Tom always likes to say. We encourage you to go look this up on YouTube, the Enron commercial. It's It's essentially... A lot of normal people in this office and, you know, like you hear they're, you know, screaming and yelling and all that stuff. And, and then it just cuts to these three men in suits with big giant mouse heads and they have their, their walking sticks with them. And it's just, it's so like, what the fuck was that? What does that have to And do? sadly it was not dead mouse for any of you EDM and techno fans. I just, I, I was very... I was very thrown off. By and episode. nowhere in the entire 60 second commercial do you have any fucking clue still what it is that Enron does. No, my best guess would be some kind of investing. Like, that's all I got from that. And you would think that, too. You wouldn't think trading natural gas. No, not at all. And presenting themselves as an energy company. And again, financial analysts you know, people who go on CNBC for a living, they love Enron because the numbers are always good. Enron was very egotistical as a company. They only wanted to deal with analysts who had strong buy ratings, meaning that they only wanted to deal with analysts who would recommend buy Enron, put everything in Enron. And they would retaliate against people who uh, analysts who did not have strong buy recommendations. So one of the interviews in the documentary was a, I believe a Merrill Lynch analyst, I think his name was John Olson. John Olson did not give him a strong, uh, did not give them a strong buy recommendation. And basically Enron threatened them. And they said, either you get an analyst who is on board with us and gives us a strong buy rec a buy recommendation, or we don't do any business with you. And so Merrill Lynch fired John Olson, and soon after Enron gave them a couple of massive investment banking deals. America. I was gonna say that feels shady. A little bit, but it's the nineties, and you know, YOLO. It's really in the year two thousand that Enron really starts to get into the national consciousness. They're at its stock in a summer of its stocks. If you remember, this was the summer, the summers of the dot-com craze of all the dot-com stocks that were soaring, 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 and then flew too close to the sun. All of these dot-coms soar and then just crash and burn spectacularly. Like, I think Priceline was one of the few that actually survived. Enron, again, is constantly, they're constantly making their earnings. They're constantly making their earnings. And the stock price keeps going up and up and up and up. Their stock price goes up 90% in the year 2000. By this time in 2000, Enron has also merged with an electric company, Portland General Electric, which was a big uh, electric and energy supplier in California. California had just at that time gone to a completely deregulated electric market. Enron decides they're going to play around with the electric grid to try and up the price of electricity. Is this like a fuck around and find out thing? 
Yes, it absolutely is a fucking round and find out thing. Okay. So it's after Enron decides to manipul- start manipulating the electric flow throughout the West that California starts getting hit with rolling blackouts in the year 2000 and then in going into 2001. Because of it, the price of electric- electricity shoots up. It gets more and more expensive. Uh, one of the electric traders uh, in the documentary talks about how a commodity that we usually traded for like twenty to thirty dollars, maybe fifty on a high day, was now trading for like two, three hundred dollars. So just obscene amounts of profit. And these were all strategies. In fact, if you watch the documentary, they released a lot of the mem- the hidden memos and recordings of all these traders laughing about how people were blacked out and people were suffering as a result of their greed. In fact, one of the interviewees on the documentary relates it to the, um, I think it's the Stanley Milgram experiment. Basically it's the experiment where there's a subject who's pushing a button that's supposedly shocking another subject. And as long as they keep telling them it's okay, they just keep shocking and shocking and shock. Now they're actually not being shocked. The person who's being shocked is not the is not the subject of the experiment. The one who's actually pushing the button is the subject of the experiment. It's it's essentially a study about how far you can push people, even even though you may be in, uh, potentially inflicting pain on them, just to see how far they would go. It was it was a very it's a very unethical experiment. It cannot be replicated, and it's but it's it's very well studied, and it it proves a point. Well, it it just proves a point that as long as an authority keeps saying it's okay, people kept pushing the button. Enron kept saying it was okay because they were making tons of money off of it. Now, and I'm kind of going out of line here, what people didn't know at this point, what no one knew outside of Enron, outside uh, executive court Enron, is that the company was basically teetering on the brink. There was... No, no money coming in other than what was coming in in California, and they were doing everything they can could to try and keep the stock price up. This is when the executives start selling. So it's in the year 2000 while the stock price is still high. This is when Ken Lay starts selling. This is when Jeffrey Skilling starts selling. This is when Cliff Baxter, who is another executive that's mentioned a lot in the documentary, documentary starts selling. They start selling all their uh, stock. At this point, did they, did they know, like, was this the Titanic for them? Like, did they know that the end was inevitable or were they just trying to like write the ship? The eternal documents would suggest that they knew what was coming. They could see the handwriting on the walls that they could only keep the stock price up for so long. Like they, they had tried a bunch of different ideas to try and have money coming in. There was a really famous, infamous deal for video on demand with blockbuster okay what how mm-hmm. what does gas have to do with mm-hmm. movies not a fucking thing they are also were trading bandwidth none of those things have anything to do with electric or gas no the blockbuster deal while it probably was about what four or five years probably ahead of its time it completely fizzled out they couldn't get the technology right. Again, it would be another decade before Netflix got the technology right. And that's part of the reason why Blockbuster, there's only one Blockbuster left. They barely made any money on that deal. The books say they made millions of dollars on it. Mark to market, baby. So they just need, they didn't care what it was. They just needed something to show that they were making revenue. It didn't matter what the fuck it was because the numbers weren't real anyway. Exactly. And that's where the fraud comes in. We now get to Andy Fastow, who is the chief financial officer. And it's a question of whether he did this with the executives basically tacit or explicit approval or not basically goes out and creates a bunch of shell companies. Are you telling me you don't think, or that it's like general knowledge that 
the higher ups did not know about this. Well, and, and and we'll again we'll get to that, but he creates these shell companies that basically exist just to do business with Enron. They exist just to hide Enron's debt. One of the more famous ones was called LJM. And he was the general partner of LJM while also being the CFO of Enron and basically making deals with himself. Can I ask a question? Is this not money laundering? Money laundering and also a massive conflict of interest. Well, but money laundering, right? And not only is he doing that, he's going to all the banks, like the major investment banks. And selling them on this, and selling them on this group that he claiming he's only on the limited partnership side of the transaction, but saying these exist only to do business with Enron. He must have been quite the charmer. He was. He basically makes all of these deals. One of the deals he makes, Merrill Lynch buys three Nigerian barges, boats, like those Big, big tanker boats from Enron and then sells it back to them at a discount three months later. That is absolutely illegal. The inter- the the attorney who would later become the class action, plain- the plaintiff's class action attorney uh, for the Enron shareholders basically says, everyone knows barges have absolutely nothing to do with Merrill Lynch's business. They're a bank. They're not an oil shipping company. So you have the banks are all kind of knowing participants in this. It's an, it's a a kind of a very much kind of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you know, type of dealings here with wall street executive types. This is all to really hide the fact that the company is millions of dollars in the red. And to just, again, keep the stock price up, keep the stock price up peek them in the positive public eye. At this point, too, they've also bought the naming rights to the Astros, Houston Astros baseball stadium at this point, which is called Enron Field. But didn't you say that they were selling their stock? So it sounds like, yeah, to the public, they were trying to portray this one thing. But then it almost sounds like behind the scenes, they were like jumping out the window. Like, was that still happening? That's exactly what, what was happening. They were telling employees and investors everything was fine. Meanwhile, they were jumping out the lifeboat. So we get to late 2000, 2001, early 2001. And Bethany McLean, who's a a reporter at Fortune, basically writes a story where she gets tipped off by a a financial analyst who goes, and basically just asks a very simple question. How does Enron make money? And no one could figure it out. The The term that keeps coming up is it's a black box. No one really knows what it does. Everyone just sees that there's profits and they always come out good. It reminds me a little bit of Action Park and just the ridiculousness of it. And that it like kept going even though it was so fucking ridiculous. Well, it's the brazenness of it. Yeah. It's the brazenness of it and it's also... Again, no one can answer how they made money. And it's in 2001 that the stock finally starts to decline. And I want to pull up the number here because I I think the highest it went was, I want to say, I think the stock price, the highest it went was like $90, $100 a share. Like, I think that's the highest it got in 2000. And it's in 2001 that it finally starts to go down. Now, part of this is the article that comes out, which is, is Enron overpriced? The argument was, was Enron an overvalued stock? Based on the fact that, again, no one can understand how they made money. Was it a stock that was, that the stock price was much higher than what it actually was worth? And the reporter, by her own admission, says that First of all, when she tried to interview Jeff Skilling about it, who always had this public persona of being very open, willing to have a relationship with the media. You know, a lot of times the analysts would say, I'll ask Jeff about this, or I'll talk to Jeff about this. You know, they weren't really analyzing. They were just 
they were just parroting whatever Enron wanted them to say. While this is going on too, California, the situation in California is becoming very political. The governor is now pushing this point President George W. Bush, Ken Lay's friend, to step in and impose price caps for electricity in California. George Bush refuses to do it, trying to help out his friend. That's a question I had too, and you may or may not know this, but at what point along the line did it become public that George Bush was connected to Enron? Was it after everything came out? Was it prior to Was the public aware at all that this was a thing? I think the public knew that there was a connection between them, but, and also too, there were a couple of appointees that were, had connections to Enron. Um, like in the cabinet. Yeah. Like I want to say FERC, the federal Ener- energy regulatory commission, which governs price caps refused to intervene, even though California state law says that they're the ones who intervene, that FERC is the one who intervenes because the chairman of FERC was someone that Ken Lay personally recommended. Well, that's convenient. And Ken Lay is fighting so hard against this because he knows this is the only money coming in the door at this point. So he now famously has a meeting with a bunch of important people. He invites an actor there, and that's going to be really important in about two seconds. I think I know who it is. I think you do, too. You might say you have total recall. What happens is Gray Davis, who could have had a presidential run, becomes so unpopular in the state of California, he gets recalled. And you know what happened when he got recalled? Again, if you're a certain age, you'll remember who won the recall election. I'll give you a hint. One of his campaign speeches was, Gray Davis has terminated California, and now it's time we terminate Gray Davis. This is how, or this is in part how Arnold Schwarzenegger became the governor of California is because of Enron manipulating energy prices in California in 2000. I had no idea that those two things had anything to do with each other. And to be fair, it's not the only reason why Gray Davis was recalled, but it was very much a part of it. Now, Arnold Schwarzenegger ended up not being a bad governor, all things considered. He did good things. He did good things. He was actually very environmental. Gray Davis's political career basically was ruined by Ken Lay, in part. He probably never forgave him for that. Probably not. Because of it, we had Kindergarten Cop as our governor, as a governor of California. I remember thinking at the time how crazy that seemed, and I don't know, it just felt very weird. This is all the things that branch off of Enron. When... The California thing calms down. The stock price is continuing to drop and continuing to drop. The public facade of Enron and Jeff Skilling is continuing to kind of deflate. And the facade is starting to crack. There's a very infamous conference call with analysts where one of the analysts kind of asks aloud why Enron doesn't produce, I think it's called a quarterly balance sheet. And... Jeff Skilling kind of takes offense to it, and he's kind of passive-aggressive about it. And he goes, we'll take that under advisement, asshole. He asks about a very simple and normal accounting thing, and he gets all upset. Like, that again, that's not a red flag. And calls an investor an asshole. Yeah. In public. That actually doesn't surprise me as much as like getting pissed about, you know, somebody asking you about a balance sheet. I mean. Well, I do. It it is very funny in the documentary because they they intersperse clips of like all the congressional hearings afterwards. So you see all these politicians. So you call them an asshole. We're getting upset about the wrong thing here. But, you know, at the time, this was, quote unquote, uncouth behavior by a by an executive. Again, the stock price continues to drop. All throughout the summer, summer, the stock price drops. They're kind of the last hope for Enron, that there was some buzz that Ken Lay was going to be asked to be, I believe, Secretary of Energy under George W. Bush. Unbelievable. There was supposedly there was, that was going to be a major announcement. 
Instead, that doesn't happen. Instead, Jeff Skilling resigns as CEO. That's the announcement. That's a turn of events. Exactly. And as someone, again, it's mentioned in the documentary, you know, when you have an executive resign, it's not abrupt. You know, there's usually like a winding down. There's a whole, you know, parade. There's a year of celebration. Unless it's attached to some kind of scandal or embarrassment. Yeah, exactly. Basically a transition of power and there's a transition of, of roles and no one really gets their dander up. But it's after this that now red flags are being raised inside the company by the rank and file workers. It's at this point where there's a, a whistleblower by the name of Sharon Watkins. She had been sent to work for Andy Fastow, the CFO, and she was the one who notices the accounting irregularities with all the, the, the dummy companies. And she actually sends a anonymous letter to Ken Lay, essentially warning him. Or she thinks she's warning him, I guess. That's that's the better word. Did she think that he didn't know? Yes. Okay. Well, that's a little naive, though. I don't know, isn't it? I wouldn't say it's naive. I think you're just, at that point, I would imagine, you're not even thinking about being naive. I think you're just trying to think about what you would do in that situation. If you were to go to anybody, you would go to the top. I get that. I would, I don't know, maybe I'm just too cynical. I would think that the CEO is aware. Yes, but I think the other thing, too, is that people who work for Enron were very proud of saying they work for Enron. It was almost kind of an exclusive club. And for a lot of people, and they go into this a little bit in the documentary and in the book as well, Sharon actually ends up writing a book about being the whistleblower to Enron, which is very good as well. But she, she's not thinking about it in the sense of being naive. She's thinking about it as, I've caught this. I have to inform my bosses. She even mentions it in the book, you know, companies don't get away with cooking the books. But when they do, it's when they admit it. It's not when it gets found out by the outside. When she notices all these irregularities, this is when it all comes out in the wash about all the secret shell companies. Because not only is Fastow dealing with himself, he's then skimming millions of dollars off these deals off the top for himself. So not only is he doing shady deals, he's skimming off the top of them. I just assumed that he was doing that anyway. So after this, he's finally fired as CFO. About a month later, Ken Lay announces, I think a couple of days after 9-11, that there's an SEC informal inquiry, then all the shit hits the fan. Mm -hmm. Within about two months after that, the retirement accounts, which were all, again, based on Enron stock. So all the retirement accounts at Enron for all the employees was tied into the stock price. Well, as the stock's declining, the retirement accounts are frozen. So none of the rank and file workers can get to their retirement money. I do remember this part of the story and it being very sad because, yeah, these the employees did really care about the company and they were invested in the company and liked their job. And they had no awareness of any of this. They had, you know, and a lot of the rank and file had no awareness of what was going on. And not only did they have no awareness, they then couldn't get out. They couldn't get their money out. Didn't some of them go bankrupt or like, I'm sure they struggled financially. I mean, a lot of people ended up, you know, people that had five, six figures in their retirement accounts ended up with pennies on the dollar. I would have been furious. And this is when all the executives are selling their stock. It's then after that, the company finally goes bankrupt on November 28th, 2001. And... It's then when basically they file for bankruptcy and they kick all the remaining employees out of the building. They literally told them they had 30 minutes to get out of the building, to collect their belongings and get out of the building. So at the time, you had, I think, 20,000 employees who were working for Enron and their various companies. And a lot of them were not executives. They were traders. They were rank and file people. Their retirement accounts were now worthless. That's so sad. And on top of that, it's right before Christmas. 
Merry Christmas. Exactly. Merry Christmas. So it's after that that formal charges are filed against the top executives. Question on that. Was it, were these charges federal? These were federal charges. Okay. So Andy Fasthow, I had, had, I believe, 98 counts against him of fraud, money laundering. There we go. Insider training and conspiracy. He pleaded guilty to two charges of conspiracy and was sentenced to 10 years with no parole to testify against Lay and Skilling. Wow, the, I'm surprised that he got 10 years. I, at this time, the government kind of wanted to make an example. Well, they should have. So Ken Lay and Jeff Skilling are charged in a 53 count, 65, 65 page indictment, which is including bank fraud, false statements, security frauds, wire fraud, money laundering, conspiracy, insider training. Why do I feel like a lot of our episodes involve indictments? We should just rename ourselves to tell me about indictments and insider training podcast. I'm good with that. These are federal charges, so they get assigned to federal court, and they're assigned to the federal court in Houston, where Enron was headquartered. Obviously, the defense attorneys want to move the case out of Houston. This was a very public embarrassment for the city of Houston, and there was a lot of public anger. I imagine that a lot of the employees were residents of Houston, right? A lot of them were based out of out of Houston. A lot of them worked at the Enron Tower. The Enron Tower was downtown on Smith Street, and it was a kind of very distinct building. In fact, I think it was a group of like two or three buildings that was connected by a circular raised walkway. Sometimes you'll see it like in car commercials. We'll put a picture up of it on, on our socials. So they were residents of the city, and they either were, were native Houstonians or they moved there for work. And again, the city of Houston had done a lot of dealing with Enron. The name was on the baseball stadium. Like a lot of the employees, the city of Houston very much kind of tied itself to the health of Enron. And they kind of, the city kind of publicly, at least from the government perspective, very much kind of bragged about the fact that they were the home of Enron. And so this was hurtful and embarrassing. And, and at least from a civic perspective, you know, egg on the face. And in the years that followed, the city took a lot of steps to kind of make people forget that, you know, kind of wash Enron's name out of the public eye. How did they do that? Well, the Enron sign was taken down off the tower there on, on the Smith Street. Enron Field was no more. They renamed the, st- the field Astros Field, I think, in 2002. And then 2003, it got its current corporate sponsor of Minute Maid. It's been Minute Maid Park ever since. For the longest time, the only physical exist uh, physical evidence that Enron existed in downtown Houston was on the stadium where they forgot the power wash a part of the of the box office. And you could still see the dirt out the line that said "Welcome to Enron Field," and that was the last public sighting of the name Enron in downtown Houston for a, a long time. But the trial goes forward in January of two thousand six, and they try both. Ken Lay and Jeff Skilling together. And I know this because I was at the trial. I was 18 years old. My history teacher had a connection. And she took a handful of us to go sit in the federal courthouse in 2006 when I was a senior in high school. And we got to watch Ken Lay testify. In fact, I actually held the door for Ken Lay at the men's room and Jeff Skilling. And neither one of them said thank you. Those smug son of a bitches. Were you excited about this? I mean, obviously you volunteered to go, but like, were you like stoked to go see this as the early law nerd that you were? I was very interested. I didn't know I was going to be a law nerd at that point, but it was very, very interesting. One thing I will tell you is that, and I'll tell the audience is that now we saw when I saw it the day I went, Ken Lay was testifying on direct. For non-law nerds, direct is when you're being asked questions by your own attorney. And so you're never going to get anything spicy on direct testimony. That's not the point of direct. Direct testimony is there's a narrative, there's a story that you want to put to the jury. 
and direct testimony is about building that narrative on a foundation. You, you've already at that point, you've spoken with your client. They know what they're going to, what you're going to ask them, at least initially, you know how they're going to answer initially. And, and when I say, you, you know, how they're going to answer, you tell you you're, they're advising them for them to tell the truth. So, you know, what, what their truth is. And so you're asking questions to kind of get certain information out. So on this day, because the one of the charges was about bank fraud and about misleading statements, they were asking a lot of things about financial statements and wire transfers and bank accounts and bank statements, things that are not the most compelling to watch. And in fact, it might lead one who's in high school to maybe fall asleep in the gallery with his head in his hands. And maybe one bangs his head on the seat. Not saying that that one is me or not me, but one. That was you. I will not confirm or deny that, but sure. You can make your own conclusions. I will say it was very surreal. I would lived there for about four years at the time. Everyone in town knew what had happened. Now, part of the defense attorney's job at that point was to try and get the case moved out of Houston because, you know, they're trying to argue that there's no way they can get a fair jury. The judge denied the motion, but everyone knew who these guys were. They were very public figures. Even before everything had happened, they were very public figures. And even then, I just remember they both had that smug executive smile with like that manufactured executive draw. Like every executive, all of a sudden kind of has it gets like a southern accent like when they become an executive like they they get this just generic with like just a tiny little like they talk like this about talking about getting your numbers together there's like an a, there's like an executive southern drawl that every like major executive gets when they start when they become an executive and they had that and they had this these smug like they thought that there were going to be consequences for them now, what ends up happening is they both get convicted. Ken Lay gets convicted of security and wire fraud. It was a maximum of 45 years of prison. He dies in prison before sentencing. That would have been the maximum, but we'll never know. He dies before he's sentenced. Intentionally uh, or unintentionally? We don't know. Gotcha. Skilling is was convicted of 19 of 28 counts. Uh, he did get acquitted of insider training. But he was sentenced to 24 years and four months in prison. Then there were other executives that were charged, that were charged and convicted. 16 people pleaded guilty for crimes committed at the company, including Merrill Lynch employees, the ones who had the, the fake sale about the Nigerian barges. But that was also then overturned on appeal. So two questions on that. Were all 16 people executives at Enron? They were executive level? I believe they were executive level, but also some of them were the Merrill Lynch employees. Right. That was my second question. Yeah. Who were part of that Nigerian barge sale. Was there any other company that they did business with? Were any of their employees tied to this? Well, Arthur Anderson, the company was actually convicted of fraud. Okay. Or found guilty of, of, of obstruction of justice because as the company was going bankrupt, they started shredding shredding paper and deleting emails. They got their conviction overturned on a technicality, but by that point, the reputation they had built up was now in the proverbial shitter, and they end up basically declaring bankruptcy and going out of business. Is that what happened to Blockbuster? Blockbuster went had a went down a different shitter. No, no, I get it, but that's <laughs> wow, something to think about. The road not taken when Blockbuster Video could have been thrown in the slammer for obstruction of justice. Yeah, they probably did get the better road of just slow and yeah, steady decline. But that is kind of the story of Enron. So it's a long and winding road. I don't know if this made any sense for the three people who are still listening to this. I appreciate you. But it was definitely something. It was a wild time to live in Houston because 
pretty much everyone had some sort of connection to Enron, whether as employees or whether they knew employees. There were a lot of people that were very, very hurt by what Enron did and quite frankly took it very personally, as they should have. Did you or any of your friends know anybody that worked at Enron while you were living in Texas? I did not, but it was it was a very wide net. And so it was very hard to find someone in town who did not have an opinion on it and didn't have a negative opinion on it because it was so egregious, so blatant. And it's just a story. It's a story about numbers. But it's also just very purely a story about greed and about how, for some people, the world is not enough. And again, it I think with this, too, it really blows my mind that this was allowed to go on as long as it did. And there is obviously certainly people covering this up for a very long time. There are supposed to be people along the line who question this, whether it's the analysts, whether it's the media, whether it's internally the executives the lawyers the accountants the board of governor the board of trustees someone along the line is supposed to say wait a minute someone who was supposed to say no never said no they all just went along with it do you think part of that is because of their connections to politicians i think it's connections to politicians i think it's connections to the business world i think for a lot of these people this was just doing business and two back then, if you remember, like this was very much a, especially I imagine in Texas, it was very much a good old boys club, old white men club. So I think they protected each other to some degree now. I mean, down there with terms of the Enron executives, yes, but you're also dealing with, you know, New York bankers and LA bankers. That's a different type of old white boys club completely. It's very interesting because when you see, The video, the leaked video of Andy Fastow selling the illegal cell company to, I think, Merrill Lynch. And you, they show the, they show him looking around the room and it's just, it's a diverse crowd. There's pasty old white guys. There's skinny old white guys. There's skinny and pasty old white guys. There are skinny and old and pasty old white guys with uh, thinning hair. There are skinny and pasty old white guys with thick hair. That sounds like the shittiest Dr. Seuss rhyme I can I can imagine. Yeah. But the point is, it's an old boys club, but it's a different type of old boys club. And they were all really happy to go around, go along with it because there was money involved. And one of the, the real interesting things, if you ever get to watch the documentary, is seeing the footage of all the congressional hearings about this. It's amazing to see this was truly a bipartisan issue. The indignation about this was truly bipartisan. I mean, you had Strom Thurmond dunking on Ken Lay. I mean, Strom Thurmond was already like 120 at this point and still serving in Senate. And even he was taking pot shots at Ken Lay. What was the target of the congressional hearings? Was it just to investigate how they got away with this? Because obviously they had the federal charges. The the congressional hearings were all in like 2001, 2002. Okay. After the bankruptcy, but before the charges. So basically this was like the precursor to the charges. Okay. They were just investigating how the bankruptcy, the financial irregularities in the bankruptcy. So this one was for the federal charges. Yes. Okay, got it. So this is where you have Jeffrey Skilling testifying before Congress. This is where you have all the Merrill Lynch bankers testifying before Congress. And the bankers all have, look like, they all look white as a ghost. Because there was a moment where I think one of the Merrill Lynch bankers says, well, we didn't, you know, we relied on their financial statements at the time. And then Forget the congressman. I think it was Carl Levin from Michigan, who was a Democrat from Michigan. He goes, and I want you to take a look at this email. This is exhibit whatever. And he says, you know, you said Enron loves these deals because they don't show, they get to bury their debt. And this was you writing an email confirming that understanding. 
And then he basically just flings it across the room, across the table at him. It's a very much fuck around and find out. When Jeff Skilling testifies, you know, they ask him about other executives. They ask him about his closest friend. I mentioned Cliff Baxter before. Cliff Baxter, who very much his self, self-worth was really tied into his work at Enron. And he was one of the executives that had taken money out but was also trying to fight against what was happening. He was so distraught that he commits suicide. It's very sad. You know, basically, and we'll put a trigger warning on this, they show, part of the congressional exhibit is the suicide note where he says, well, once I had great pride working for Enron, now there's none. And that's a real human element, human tragedy element to this. And it really just kind of, underlines the amount of just damage that lay and skilling and fast down and a lot and a lot of those executives did to a lot of people and i think it's easy to forget that there is a human element to it i mean as crooked as these guys were and greedy as these guys were they weren't all like this some of them had a conscience some of them as you mentioned with this guy was fighting back with it. I think that kind of does highlight the humanity and and the toll this took, even people that knew about it and were involved. You know, he's one of the ones that are really shown to have a conscience. Not many others really are of the executive class there. And again, they left a large amount of collateral damage from the employees that were left with nothing to ruining Gray Davis's political career to the people in California that they hurt because they wanted to play fat. They wanted to play Maverick with the electricity. I mean, to the linemen who work for the electric, for the electric company that now were left basically penniless. They hurt a lot of people. Let me ask you this. And, and I don't know if this was a thing. Did any of the former workers sue them? Did they file a lawsuit against Enron? So I believe there was a class action. I know there was one by the shareholders. I think there was one by the employees as well. And I also think, I want to say, I think there, I think they, by law, by court order, they had to set up a fund to, to remunerate the workers in some extent or to some extent to basically that they would get at least some monies back. How much they received, I don't know. It definitely would not be the first time that that there's a ruling against them and then the company just doesn't pay. Yeah, and whatever it was, no matter what they got, it wasn't enough. No, it's it's never going to be enough to, to undo the damage that was done. One thing this made me think about, you said this happened, they filed for bankruptcy in November of 2001, you said? Uh, Like late November, early December 2001, yes. So, of course... Just going back to that time, you know, thinking this was right after 9-11. And at first I was thinking as you were telling the story that maybe, because it was a big news story at the time, I remember it. And and at first I thought, well, did the tragedy that was 9-11 and all the aftermath that, that came in the shadow of that, do you think that suppressed any news about this? But then clearly not, because it was a big news story. And I wonder then kind of, on the counterpart to that, was this scandal a distraction, like almost something we needed at that point? Because, I mean, you know, this was such a, 9-11 was such a mark for our generation and, and, and prior generations. Like, I mean, it, it just turned the world or at least the country upside down. So I'm thinking now more it was a good distraction from that than anything. Good distraction. I don't know if that would be the right word for it. I think it diverted the media's attention diverting the attention from this this tragedy and this this trauma i think that collectively the country was going through to focus on this corrupt corporation you know what i mean so i think it it probably at the time was an easier shift to people you know it it was you know the other thing too is by that point i believe we had gone into afghanistan was it that fast I want to say, I think it was like October or November of 2001 that Bush had said, we're going into Afghanistan. 
You may be right. I thought it was a little longer than that, but you could be right. And also, too, while this was going on with Enron, we also had Anthrax. Oh, yeah. I forgot about Anthrax. That was a thing. I always go back to Lewis Black, who's comedian, had a very good bit about, you know, we didn't have enough information after, before 9-11, and then after it, no one could get enough information. So you had news scrolls going about 18 different directions. Speaking of news scrolls, the chyrons at the bottom of the screen, because I just learned recently that chyrons became a thing from Fox News because of 9-11, because they wanted to keep the nation constantly updated on, on what was going on. So that I didn't know that. You know, then he he goes into jokes about, you know, they have, you know, it's going 18, 90 miles an hour. So you only see things like terror in your neighborhood. And then they got the stock, the Bloomberg stock ticker. You know, someone's making money, but it ain't fucking you. 9-11 was one of the two moments where news media completely changed. The other one was the O.J. Simpson trial. Oh, 100%. Yeah. In a different time. The Enron thing probably happens a lot quieter. But because we are now fully engulfed in the 24-hour news cycle by this point with multiple cable channels and with the internet, it gets it catches on real quick. And there were a lot of positive feelings about the stock market during the 90s and the 2000s. And Enron kind of ate a lot of that away. That part's not necessarily a bad thing. The stock market is not the economy. And even you said, I think, yeah, it's not a bad thing because of the, it feels like the peak of the absolute public brazenness of, of corporate greeting, corporate corruption. You know what I mean? At least companies now, I feel like are a little more quiet about it. Yeah, I think that did need to change, and and public sentiment and and perception did need to change, and I'm glad it did. Well, and it, it, I'm glad it didn't change in vain. I'm glad people were caught and brought to justice for it. So, but let us know what you think. Let us know what your uh, memories are about it. Let us know if you have any stories about Enron. You can reach out to our socials at the Tell Me About Podcast on TikTok and Instagram. Uh, you can email us at the tell me about podcast at gmail.com. But we thank you for sticking with us. We thank you for a great 2023. Like I said, this is our last full episode of 2023. If you made it to episode seven, uh, 17, we thank you. We love you. We appreciate you. Uh, we thank you for coming on this journey for us when we can't wait to see what 2024 has in store. And like I said, keep an eye out on your on your feeds, whether it's Apple or, or Spotify or wherever you get your podcast, keep an eye out over the next couple of weeks. We're going to have those mini episodes out and please let us know what you think of them. Cause that's how we know whether or not to make more. Yes. And please don't forget to rate review and subscribe. Definitely tell us episode suggestions and comments to the tell me about podcast at gmail.com. Thank you guys. And we'll see you in 2024. Bye.